Who's a developer here? Okay, who's a designer? Okay, and any project managers or bloggers? Or? Okay, so we have a good mix. Um, I hope everybody will get something out of this, so don't, don't worry if you're not a developer. Um, so we're going to do a little time travel today. Uh, we've all wanted to time travel, I'm sure. We're going to go back to 2016. And in 2016, I accepted a job at Boston University. Uh, they have been uh, entirely WordPress for over 10 years now. And with a few exceptions, uh, some tools, uh, everything's WordPress. So uh, they have a multi-network, multi-site instance. So it's quite large. There's some, some quite intimidating things in there that uh, I still didn't understand when I left. But it was always interesting. Um, and I'm going to talk about two departments today. So one department is uh, ISNT, we'll call it, Information Services and Technology. Uh, and that was the typical IT department within the university. They handled the machines, they handled uh, the infrastructure, um, uh, support for students and staff. And then there was a department called External Affairs. Uh, and everything within there uh, was basically everything that had to do with communications. Uh, we had a department that focused on uh, lobbying and making sure that uh, the people passing bills knew about what we were working on and, and we looked out for the best interests of the university. Um, and we interacted with ISNT very frequently uh, on a daily basis pretty much. Um, so this was our GitHub uh, organization. Um, and this was uh, uh, as of a few weeks ago. So there's a few new faces that I did not work with, but there's also a few faces that I had left as well. Um, and within external affairs was interactive design, and that was the department I was in. And that department functioned like an agency. Um, we did everything from wireframing to the sites to building plugins. Uh, we interacted directly with our clients. Uh, the clients were the colleges, schools, universities, um, special initiatives. Uh, periodical magazines that we posted online. Um, and so we, we did everything. We did photography, we did videography, and all, all, the whole gamut. We, we had people to do everything. Everybody was very talented. It was great. So that clientele, um, in addition to that, the, the publications and stuff, they had three options. They could get in line and wait for us to help them. They could use a pre-built theme that we controlled and we, we, we deployed and we only, it was kind of like .com, we only allowed certain themes to be on the, on the platform. Uh, we also had an internal uh, framework that we built that worked very well and had all of our features for our different plugins. Um, or they could work external, with external agencies. We had a few relationships, um, but then they would pay full price if they worked with us. It was subsidized by the university. Um, and the point with that was everybody could afford a best-in-class website and the university would have a solid uh, web presence, a, a best-in-class web presence. So within ID was me. And after I got settled, I sat with my supervisor and he said, uh, I'm going to give you an assignment um, just to see what you think and, and get a fresh eyes on what we're working on. So he said that we have this theme. Uh, it's just about ready to, to go live a couple weeks from now. Uh, I want you to just, just look at it, make some points, and tell me what we should improve on, what we should do different. So I took some time, and I came up with a list. And basically, it was much more detailed than this, but um, they fell into three different buckets. Uh, we had code style issues. We had some missing best practices or incorrect best practices. And there were some performance improvements that I suggested. Um, so we, we sat down and we went over the list and we talked about it and he said, yes, these are all things we're aware of. I'm glad you brought them up. Uh, let's fix some of them right now. If we're missing some, you know, we have security issues or anything like that, let's fix that. Uh, but let's, let's table this and we'll return a little bit later to that when we have some time to uh, address it properly. So fast forward about six months, um, I had mentioned that if you uh, went with us, you would just have to wait your turn. Uh, we had a queue. Uh, at that six month time, we had a two year wait list. So if there were no additions or no delays, uh, nobody jumped the line because they were important at the university, uh, we, we, we had two year wait. So this, this wasn't sustainable. Um, it wasn't fair to the, the departments and, and the schools that we're waiting their turn, and they just they, they, they had to get out sooner than that. Um, so we 
pitched some ideas to the university, we got approved to double. So we were about 26 in ID at the time. There was four or five developers. Um, so we, we were going to essentially double. So at that point, we brought this list back up. And we said, we have to fix this now, because if we start scaling our department and we're not doing things consistently, we're not enforcing best practices, uh, we're going to have some serious problems down the road. And we're going to have to quadruple in order to even maintain that. So uh, we sat down. We started coming up with some plans and, and discussing it some more. Um, but these were more common in our code than we thought. So after I did my first assignment, I started to notice these. And I would flag certain things to, to Steve. And I would say, hey, uh, here's another example of this. But it's, let's start making a list as we work on things of areas we want to prove, repositories and sites we want to fix. Um, but basically, we, we had to solve this and prevent that long-term technical debt that we would, we would build up. So we sat down and we established our goal, which was we needed a structured, mandatory code review process to enforce consistency, improve code quality, promote learning, knowledge, uh, sharing, and collaboration. Uh, as I mentioned, we do a lot of knowledge sharing with IST. Uh, every other week, we would have a meeting with them, and we would uh, present something we were working on, talk about it, how can it uh, utilize, how can we utilize it within the university? Uh, but we wanted to do more of that. Uh, but above all, we didn't want it to inhibit uh, our, our, our team members from getting work done. We wanted it to feel natural. Uh, we wanted it to uh, feel effective. We wanted it to be a positive experience. Um, and we wanted the team to get better and write better co quality code. So. so we started making a list of our challenges. Um, we wanted to keep these in mind as we went through this process. So our first one was, you, it was not uncommon for you to work on many things at a time. Um, so it was, it was functioning like an agency. As agency owners know, you have four or five projects going on at a time. Um, these could be you know, wireframing stage. This could be design stage or development stage. Um, so again, we, we, we didn't want to inhibit work from getting done no matter what the stage of the project was. Um, we don't just have developers that write code. Um, in interactive design, there are designers. There's uh, something called a producer. And they would do a lot of email campaigns and stuff like that with HTML and CSS. Um, and the department's also structured in a way where producers or designers could switch disciplines and go more into developer or designer or vice versa. Um, so again, if we have our, uh, our GitHub organization, this is uh, interactive design within that organization. Uh, these are the people that uh, identified as designers. These are uh, producers or other people that would help out. And these are developers. Uh, we, and again, th there's two in here that are working there now since I've left. And there's one in there and myself that have moved on. Um, so at any time, we're, it was three, four, five-ish, and, and it wasn't a constant number. Um, but you can see the difference of we have many more people of other disciplines than we do of developers. So that was something to keep in mind in this process. Um, there's lots of variation of experience. So uh, we had entry level. We had more senior developers, uh, even designers. We had senior designers and junior designers. Um, so that was another thing we wanted to make sure that the junior people were not getting left behind. And likewise, the senior people were not being burdened with uh, more work. Uh, this is something I ran into a lot. Uh, some projects are very long term. They take a long time to, who's, who here has ever worked in higher ed? OK, so they, they feel my pain. That's more than I expected. Um, but it's not uncommon for a project to take a couple years. Um, there's many stakeholders, and sometimes it just takes a long time to get approval for certain things. Um, so the, the issue I ran into was it was very hard for me to dig up explanations for why things were a certain way. Um, people would come and go in the university, and if there was no documentation in the code, which was not uncommon, unfortunately, um, you would have a hard time figuring out why a line was a certain way. You could tell that it was very... Um, very purposeful. It was meant to be there that way. But you couldn't figure out, if you took it out of there, what would break. And so sometimes that was a little fun. Um, we also looked at some technical factors. 
uh, there were some technologies we were just stuck with. Uh, we were WordPress, for example. We were not interested in migrating. We were very, uh, all our, all our, we were all in on WordPress. Um, we were also all in on GitHub. We had all of our repositories on GitHub. One of my first tasks was to move our remaining SVN repos over. We used Slack, we used SAS, um, and there were some design tools that we also wanted to keep using. We weren't interested in switching those. We also considered some human elements. So we wanted uh, this process to empower our team members to, to grow, to be better, um, to help each other. And it's, it's a big opportunity for them to learn. So in day to day, it's, it's hard to put a, aside time to learn. But if you're doing work while you're, you're, you're learning, that's, that you make good use of your time. Uh, motivated people love to learn. So this helped with retention. If we're enabling our employees to learn, uh, they're going to stay longer. And it also helps uh, people learn how things are working internally. If you're newer, it's going to help you uh, get up to speed with how things are done, how people work. Um, and it will help make more informed decisions uh, later on in, in future projects. Um, as I mentioned, it's also an opportunity for more knowledge sharing. Uh, everybody on the team was very good at what they do. And we wanted to harness that in some way where uh, they could provide feedback like this, but not be burdened again with putting that time aside and having to sit down and, and knowledge share. Uh, improved collaboration. So like I said, we, we interacted a lot with ISNT. They helped us build plugins and, and different infrastructure aspects uh, for the different projects. Uh, but we wanted to work with them more. They are also very smart. They knew a lot of things that we didn't know, and we wanted to learn from that. It's also improved your onboarding. Um, onboarding is very expensive, it's very difficult, very time consuming. So if you have a structured set of rules and guidelines, um, you can throw someone into the process a lot sooner than that. Uh, they can learn from this process, they can read the documentation, uh, they can learn from the more senior members as they review their code. Uh, new people that come in that have new skill sets, we can, the senior people can learn from them and we can start to use their skill sets throughout our new projects. So then we had our steps. So we, we know what our challenges are. We know what we need to do. Um, so we need to make our rules. We're going to create the process, document it, and then train. So this is where it gets good. We, we wanted to identify the tools we need. So we made our rules. The first one was everyone must use the same code style. Um, this just saves time across the board. If I write code and then uh, someone else writes another line of code and they're spaced differently and they're laid out differently. It, I have to think about it when I switch projects or I look at their code. But if everybody lays it out the same, they use the same style guides, that cognitive block is gone when you first switch into that project. So that's one aspect of that. Um, it's also, uh, you, would, you would have things exactly where you expected them to be. So it, we had guidelines about how to organize our file structure. And it made it easier for the producers to jump in and know where the email templates would be, and vice versa. And that, that was something that was very important to us. Everyone must follow the best practices. These two together are uh, basically coding standards. I've given some talks about, about that in the past, so I encourage you to go look at those in more detail. Um, these are the rules in place that enforce consistency, and they prevent a lot of common mistakes. Um, a lot of these are in place because of lessons that have been learned by people out in the wild. They contribute them back, and uh, they publish them, and people learn from them, and, and that's why they're there. Um, everyone must use the same workflow, um, and I'm not talking about open Photoshop, save it into your folder, and publish it to the, to the, the network drive. Um, I'm talking about the, our GitHub flow with this. Um, I'll talk about this more later on. Everything must be properly documented. Um, as I mentioned before, it was very difficult often to go into a project and understand what was happening and why. Um, we required that every pull request was going to need to be updated documentation. Um, it also helped us ask the question, does it need user documentation? Does it need developer documentation? Uh, these were things that we wanted to enforce as we committed code to the repos. Uh, if, you, if you go to do documentation at the end of a project, um, 
that's really a drag. Nobody likes to do that. It's time consuming. It's much harder, uh, and it takes more time often. Uh, so if you document as you go, the code is fresh in your mind. What's happening is fresh in your mind, uh, and it's much easier to get it in at that point. And a bonus one, it didn't ap apply to everything, but if appropriate, it would be accompanied by tests. Um, so this mainly applied to our plugin repositories and not so much our themes. So we, we sat down and we started to brainstorm our process. Um, and we go back to that question, what is the correct way to Git for us? So there's, there's a bunch of different ways to use Git. Um, ISNT was using the more traditional way. Uh, we were using a flatter way. And ID, they, a lot of people just committed right to master. Um, our plugins would use pull requests. Uh, but they used something in ISNT that was basically, um, this is more traditional. So if you use Git branching, this is more what's built in. But these cat, these branches have categories. Um, there's features, there's hotfixes, and there's releases. Um, and they, they, they're types. They're classified. They, they have a specific purpose. They go into specific branches, and there's specific flows to each of those. Um, this doesn't really work with GitHub. GitHub's more flat. Uh, so we didn't want to use this. We wanted to get away from this. Um, this is the GitHub flow. So you make a branch, and it goes right back into the primary branch. And you just go. It simplifies it. It makes it easier for uh, more people to understand Git. Um, and so we, we went with this because, again, Git was our tool. That was a technical limitation. And we just thought that this worked best. We had a few adjustments, though. Um, so for example, we, uh, we had different primary branches. So on plugins, we had develop as our primary branch. And themes was master. Um, again, all code must go through a pull request. There's no committing directly to master. You can lock this down in GitHub. So only administrators were allowed to force push to master. Um, so if a designer accidentally committed code to master, they wouldn't be able to push it. They would, only, they would have to recommit it to a, a, a branch and then have a PR. Um, and then if for plugins, when develop is the primary branch, we would always open a code uh, PR to master when it was ready, We'd do a final code review, and then we would version it. Um, we would use that PR to increment the version number and update the change log. Again, we're updating the documentation as we go. We're not going back later and doing it when uh, we find out we really need it. And then finally, we would create a release in GitHub. So the next question was, what are our coding standards? What do we want to enforce? Um, this was really easy. WordPress already has coding standards. Um, and so we decided to use those. They are maintained by the community. They're best practices within the community. Um, so this was easy for us to, to choose. We wanted, um, we, we wanted our team members to become accustomed to the way WordPress has, writes code so that they might be less intimidated to jump into WordPress core and contribute back. Um, they could open up core files, and, and it would match what our coding style was, and they would be able to learn from the code and what's actually going on. Um, there were some differences. Uh, we had a, a separate GitHub repository for our coding standards. And within that, we, uh, we had things like PHP namespaces. They, those were required in our plugins. Uh, but WordPress does not have that in their coding standards because uh, it still supports PHP 5.2. Um, so that was the difference that we had. We had several differences we wanted to have, and we would document them there. Continuous integration, we, we used Travis. We didn't have a reason to switch, um, and we decided to just keep going with that. So then we started thinking about how do we enforce our, our, our rules. We have these rules, but how do we make sure people follow them? Um, we, we looked at several different things. Uh, we ended up in implementing basic PHP linting in uh, Grunt. So anyone that was running Grunt Watch and editing um, templates, they would know if they had a fatal PHP error in their code. But it was very basic. It was only PHP uh, fatal errors, basically. Um, we knew that PHP CS was the proper tool. Um, but this is really intimidating for designers and uh, producers. We, we didn't want them to have to dive into this and uh, figure out what's going on. The, there's also the barrier of having them install it all on their machine. So we didn't, we didn't want to do that. It wasn't simple enough for us. 
Um, we also didn't want to encourage them to use the auto code fixer, the, co the PHP code beautifier. Um, we wanted them to go in and fix the errors themselves so that they could learn from that and uh, hopefully not make those mistakes later on. Um, many people learn from doing, including myself, and so we wanted to encourage that process. Um, so we looked at some tools. Uh, we decided to use Code Climate. It's similar to Scrutinizer, and there's a few others out there. Um, but basically, it would give you a dashboard. It would analyze your code on every commit. It would give you metrics. Uh, it would point out issues. And this included PHP CS. They had several different engines uh, built in. Uh, we used the ESLint one, the Markdown Lint for our readme files, and SASLint in addition to the, the PHP CS. Um, and we used this to catch our mundane issues that uh, we didn't want the, the pull request reviewer to have to worry about. So similar to uh, we didn't want people, when they switch projects, to have to think about uh, the code style. We wanted all those things to be fixed before they hopped in to review the code. Um, so this is an example of some issues that would be listed. Another benefit of this is that um, on themes, we didn't have uh, Travis most of the time because it just wasn't necessary at the time. Um, so we, we needed a way to have a separate integration in GitHub. So this allowed us to do that. We also didn't want to have the Travis build fail if there were coding standards issues uh, because there were instances where we, didn't, we chose not to fix certain violations, just uh, let them in, we'll fix them later, or it was something we didn't follow and we couldn't override in the, in the standards. Um, so this was great. It also, on, on a quick view, it lets the person see um, whether there's code style issues or whether there's test issues, and it's, it's easier to break down. Um, you can also click in here and uh, click the link on the PR. It will tell you uh, what issues you introduced in that PR and then which ones you fixed. And then after it's merged, you have uh, the line showing what, was, what the status is when it was merged. Um, you could also do um, uh, hook in your test coverage, and it would tell you uh, you can enforce a minimum percentage of new code that had to be tested, accompanied by tests. So that was good for our plugins. Um, and then the other benefit that was really big for us was there's something called the prepare step, and you could specify uh, the configuration files in a separate repository. So in our coding standards repo, we had a folder with all of these linting configuration files. Um, so every single repo across our GitHub install that wanted to follow, we wanted to follow these, we would include the same file. Um, this was great because if the rule set was updated, the WordPress rule set was updated, we could just uh, make our changes or our overrides in one location, and then every time the next, uh, the next time that the repository was updated, it would pull it for every single repo. So we had our process down, we, we moved into documentation. Um, we set up a contributing file, uh, but similar to the coding standards configurations, we didn't include it in every repo, and every repo had uh, a link to this. It said, here's our, our contributing guidelines. We have them uh, in this, at this location. And so again, we have a single point to update. It's not a burden to update these things as we make changes and we evolve. Uh, we just link to it. Um, and again, documentation, we, we wanted it to be updated on every single pull request. So especially in plugins, this becomes important. Um, we have a running list that we we have it in an unreleased version, and if you add on each pull request what you're changing, when you make the release, it's much easier to compile those changes. Uh, sometimes we deal with this in WordPress. We have to go back and look at all the tickets and figure out what changed uh, and highlight the, make the callouts of what the major things are. But with this, we were just able to copy them, uh, put them into the release, and you know, releasing doesn't take much time because our documentation is already done. Um, so then we started training people. We had face-to-face -face training. Uh, we, we, did, um, we introduced it to a few people, tried it out, uh, and then we introduced it to everybody, and we started uh, having live sessions where people would commit. We would go through the process. We would test it. People would ask questions. Uh, we made ourselves available to anyone that was, that was making changes and had questions. That helped a lot. We also showed ISNT at one of our knowledge-sharing meetings what was going on. And then we went into our beta testing phase. 
And it worked, but we found a lot of new things. So let's go over the new things we found. Uh, we wanted to limit the PR scope. Nobody should submit a 5,000 line code review. Um, nobody's gonna read that, nobody should have to read that. That's very difficult to review. Um, it might happen sometimes, but that should be very rare. Um, you shouldn't be creating a burden for the code reviewer. The, the, the code should be easy to review, easy to digest, um, and you're, you're more likely to introduce errors into your code base if you have larger commits, larger PRs. Um, include a URL to test. Whenever possible, you should have a staging environment for someone to just click it, uh, verify the code works, uh, try to break it, and, and just, just make sure that the PR is doing what it says it does, only what it says what it does. Avoid the LGTM. So this one, um, <laughs> this one's fun. Sometimes PRs are very, very minimal, and that's okay. But if your code is more than one or two lines, you should really try to say something positive or um, confirm that it works. Does it say it, this PR does this and this? Um, just it helps the person know that you actually reviewed the code, you actually put thought into it, and you didn't just look at it and, and, and checked it off. Um, a good way to test this is to make a PR and describe something that the code does not do and see if you get it looks good to me. If you do, then you know, we need to step back and we need to talk about that. Um, or put a little small bug in there and see if it gets passed, even though that shouldn't get passed. Um, where possible, you want to make suggestions, but you don't want to do the work for them. Again, we want them to go back. We want to make changes. We want to make the improvements so that they learn by doing. I mean, it's also not your responsibility as the reviewer. The responsibility is the person that wrote the code and worked on the pull request. That could be multiple people, um, but we, as code reviewers, it's not our job to go in and actually fix it for them. Um, in GitHub, they have a new feature where you can actually make suggestions in line, uh, and the person that created the pull request can accept those changes and merge them right in. So this uh, makes that a lot faster. Again, you're not actually writing it, but in some situations, uh, you might need to visualize what you're describing, and this could be helpful there. Uh, we started enforcing a rule to delete your branches after you merged. Um, this became important because you didn't want to have thousands of branches over time. Project goes on for a long time. Uh, however many branches you end up using over time, uh, if you didn't delete those, they would just pile up and pile up. And you wouldn't be able to tell what had been merged very easily. You'd have to look at each branch in, in the Git tree. Um, so as soon as it's done, delete it. It prevents people from committing new code to it. They have to open a new branch and a new pull request. Um, yeah, no, no, it's done. Once it's merged, you close it, no new code. Always start from a new branch. We developed some uh, rules. They, these are loose, but basically, Use common sense, have good naming uh, conventions on your branches. Uh, I like to use the GitHub issue number and then a brief description. Um, when some people did fix slash, uh, when we released plugins, we always prefixed it with release slash. Um, and it just, again, it, it kind of did what the other Git method of Git did. It categorized the branches, but just through the names. Um, we had some responsibility guidelines. Uh, it's the responsibility of the creator to keep it up to date, uh, prevent um, merge conflicts. So if there's merge conflicts, you have to go back in and update it before the person reviews it. And after you get the thumbs up and you get the, the, the approval, it's your job to do some final testing, merge the branch, and delete the branch. This one we never um, encountered, but basically what, what would happen if two people disagreed, the reviewer, and the person that opened the pull request disagreed. Um, what we did was, we, we didn't want it to be an argument, we wanted it to be a discussion. So all the opinions should be documented with reasons why on the pull request, and then a third party could get called in and make the final decision. Um, it's not about being right, it's not about getting your way, it's more about doing what's best for that project, um, which is the most future-proof, and which uh, is easier to pivot from into a, into a different approach if it's not the correct uh, way to tackle it. Uh, we also wanted to encourage good uh, etiquette when writing about people's code. Um, language is very important and tone is very important. We didn't want people feeling 
uh, oh, John hates me because he, he always gives me bad pull request reviews. Um, and a lot of times we, we lose that. We lose those, those little nuances in written communication where we're in Slack all the time and uh, you know, we may word something a certain way and it gets taken the wrong way only because they can't, they can't see me and they can't read my body language. So we wanted to uh, encourage people to be positive and don't add stress to the person that opened the pull request. Um, so one important one was to not review the person. You want to review the code only. Uh, someone worked hard on that code review and you don't want to, you don't want to make the code seem like it's bad. I mean, it might be bad, but you can word it in a way that's more encouraging. So this is a bad example. <laughs> I couldn't find real examples, but I'm sure you could find examples like this out in the wild in open source. So this is a little bit better. Uh, it's, it's less aggressive, but you're still attacking the person. You're addressing the person, the, the feedback at the person. Clearly describe your problems and, and your questions. Say um, what we need to do, why. Ask the question, is this meant to be? Um, wh what would happen here? Is this on purpose? Engage the person. And avoid, you, avoid you. If you say we, uh, it feels more like we're in this together and uh, we're working together on this. It's not, you need to do this, you need to do that. We should try to do this better. So again, you should use output scaping here. We should use output escaping here. Um, sometimes your, your reviews will be critical, uh, and that's OK. But you have, to, you, you have to make sure you engage the person. If you engage the person, uh, they're going to receive that criticism much better. Um, Again, in the last example, we, we clearly state the problem. If Boolean value is passed to the function, it looks like it would be converted to a string. Is this intended behavior? If so, can we document it? So this is a, a, a very simple example. But in pull requests, you'll encounter much more, much more in-depth questions and situations. Um, but again, if you're engaging the person, then they're going to they're gonna receive that feedback a lot better. Um, we also found out that there were some additional factors to this succeeding. Um, these were not so much in the, the process itself or in the day-to-day, -day, uh, but more within the entire department and the people above, uh, the people doing the code. This one's very important. So uh, if everybody's not on board, then there's going to be people disagreeing. There's going to be... Um, people doing things different ways, the, 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 all the benefits of the pull request process are, are going to disappear, um, all because I'm not doing it the way everybody else is. And it takes time. So it takes um, buy-in from everybody, even project managers, even management. Um, this is now something that we do, and we have to account for it in our projects, in our weekly timesheets, everything like that. I got to skip ahead, but this is just like wireframes now. This is part of the process. Um, we need to clearly set expectations. Um, this, you're introducing a lot of tools. You're introducing a lot of new things. Make sure that the team members know how to interpret these, this data and what to do with these tools. Um, this one was pretty common. So uh, this screen right here has a lot of information. Uh, we see we have our test coverage, we have our maintainability score, which is basically how long Code Climate thinks it will take to fix the issues that it finds. Um, we have our, our, our graphs, we have numbers, all these things. But a lot of people got hung up on the C. So uh, we had a couple situations where people were just spending time in opening pull requests just to get this letter higher. Um, we all want to do good. We all want to get high scores. It's just a part of human nature. And so people wanted to have A's. Um, so we had to step back and say, hey, this is, that's not the goal here. This is a tool to help us find potential issues. But it doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. The high number is not the important part. The important part is that our, our code gets better. We have less problems that um, will hurt us down the road. Um, and, and so 
you have to take these with a grain of salt. You have to know what they mean, interpret them, and know what to do with this information. And finally, everyone reviews code, uh, reviews code that's able to. Um, this is the most senior person to the newest person. Um, it's not the intern's responsibility to do all the code reviews. Um, everybody's learning from everybody from each other, and that 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 was the most important one here. Um, the other benefit of this is we have these PRs, these points in time, and we could uh, integrate with um, different tools. So we had Travis, but we also um, we, we had pull request templates, so when they click new pull request or new template, it would show you what information you had to put. This is one from um, Gutenberg. Um, we also experimented with automated documentation. So this was set up on our plugin repositories where uh, when you committed to master and you tagged, uh, this would run on Travis, and it would automatically commit and push back to GitHub pages. Um, so as long as we did our job and we included all the inline documentation, that information would get extracted into this codex, um, and it was all done automatically after you set it up. So this was a great benefit. Um, people could refer to this without having to download the repository or jump into the code. Um, it was just available for the team members to use. Um, we looked into some accessibility scanning. Uh, this is a tool called Pally. Uh, we didn't quite get this working, but uh, we wanted to uh, run this on our framework where we could scan it with, with code changes so we could see if we were introducing any accessibility issues. Um, they also have a dashboard where you can set up different sites, you can continually scan, uh, and it can show you metrics as far as which sites have more, uh, more issues. Um, we worked on trying to automatically deploy to staging. Uh, this was difficult and we decided not to do it because we had too many sources of truth. Um, we had our production site, but it wasn't uncommon to clone that site to staging, uh, make many changes, and get it ready for the next version uh, before moving it over to production. And then it wasn't, also wasn't uncommon for each team member to have their own sandbox that they would clone into and do some work before they committed the code or before they made it on staging or production. Um, so we didn't know how we would define what site the content would come from to test against. Um, we looked at a tool called Alex, which basically will run and try to uh, catch wording issues and language issues. Um, we experimented with adding this in our commit messages. So it was a, a pre-commit hook. It would scan whatever the person wrote in as their commit message and maybe make some suggestions of ways to better word things. Um, this is also can be built into many of the code editors. They have add-ons uh, for Adam and all those. Um, and as you write, it can tell you how to uh, be more sensitive and more inclusive. Um, with our framework, our theme framework, we wanted to look into visual regression testing so we can make sure we didn't make any mistakes. Um, so this is uh, something by Andrew Taylor and Pantheon. They had this scrubber that you could see the differences. It would, it would highlight the visual differences. Um, so we would make sure that the changes were intentional. If, the, if what was on the screen was changing, uh, we could confirm that, yes, that's what we wanted to happen. And then finally, uh, one thing that we added was, uh, again, we wanted to empower our team members to learn and get better. So we ended up, um, we bought a Treehouse license. Uh, that We found that their courses more closely aligned with our, our standards and our goals and how our team worked. Um, so we had some team licenses, and uh, interactive design was very uh, nine to five. We didn't want people going home, working on the weekends, getting burnt out. So this was a little tricky because we didn't want to say, hey, go home and learn new things and come back. We said, hey, this is available to you. You can use it if you want. And what we found was, um, excuse me, a lot of people would actually go home and say, hey, I, I was on Treehouse last night. And Again, they, they wanted to learn. They were motivated. They, they went home. They learned JavaScript. They learned WordPress theming. Um, so this was a great benefit that we added. And it had nothing to do with our process, but it was just a, an add-on that we had uh, that we made available. And finally, everyone makes mistakes. This isn't about being perfect. This isn't about not making mistakes. Um, this makes everything succeed. You, every, and again, everybody has to buy in and have the same attitude. 
Um, that this, I, I can't stress this enough. I would have five slides if I could, but that wouldn't make sense. So thank you. That's an old link. I will tweet a new link. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Does anyone have any questions for Jonathan? We had one in the middle. Hi, uh, thank you. And uh, so do you all ever have to work on sites that you've outsourced that have come back to you? And if so, like, how do you handle that process now? Because we kind of deal with that. Yeah, so... Um, we would we would work with specific vendors that we knew worked well and with us and uh, worked with the same standards and guidelines. Um, uh, that 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 helped a lot. But we also had um, we we encouraged those projects to be done on our framework, our theme framework. So all our themes were child themes of that framework. Um, and as long as they were building from that, we knew that they were somewhat following the same methodologies and and things like that. Unless there was something really advanced that required a custom plugin or something like that. So um, choosing who you work with is important. People that value the same things and follow the same guidelines. OK, are there any more questions? Can you talk a little bit more about why you chose to manage your plugins and themes on the separate branches? Yeah, so. Um, with plugins, it wasn't uncommon for us to build many, make many changes before we wanted to release. We didn't want to release every change. We wanted to do them in versions. So, um, for example, BU Profiles was a plugin. Maybe we wanted to um, change the thumbnail size, and then we wanted to change the input fields, and we would do that all, and we would release it as one version. So Master was always our source of truth in themes and plugins. Um, that was the, our latest deployable code. And as we made changes, we wanted to test it against other environments, many sites. Um, and so we would do that in develop. We would have develop deployed to our staging area. Um, and if we found any errors, we would fix them. And then we would, when we were ready, we would merge that into master. And then we'd have a new version that we would, we would deploy. Themes that didn't really make sense because uh, there was so many changes. Designers would make CSS changes, commit it, commit it, and it was it was uh, it was inhibitive of getting the code out quickly because it didn't make sense for make one CSS change and then merge it into master, and we just did it right into master. How do you deal with the time management of the review process itself? Like, if you're implementing it for the first time, especially if you're on a smaller team, you know it's going to bite out a large chunk of people's time. So, how would you go about handling? that with a small team? Yeah, so at the beginning, I mentioned that we only had a couple people involved with it. We tried it out with a few projects. Um, and we realized that it, uh, as we added more projects to it, we had to have everybody on board. And that's when we sat down and we trained everyone. Um, if you have a smaller team, it might be hard to justify it. But it, excuse me, um, it will be worth it in the future. Um, you'll have the documentation. You'll have uh, the the biggest part of the, about about this is you have a pull request with all the discussion, and you have a history you can refer back to. Um, so it will save you time in researching why things were a certain way later. Um, yeah, it, it's tough to justify, but you know maybe it's at the beginning you're putting in four or five extra hours a week or something like that. Um, but as you scale, it, it will be worth it to have all that that history there. <laughs> Do you have educational resources that you like for developers who are beginning this type of process and beginning this process of managing other developers um, and incorporating a code culture into an organization? It's a good question. Um, I like to look at what other organizations are doing, what open source projects are doing. Um, a lot of these tools I found from just doing that. Um, and then I would research them, how they worked, um, how we could implement them in our process. Um, I mean, you could read about uh, people skills and like how to word things with people. Um, th there's no real one resource because this is coming from all different aspects. Um, there's technical, there's interpersonal skills, there's all those things. Um, I'm happy to sit with you and give you some more. I don't have like one resource that I used. I kind of just pieced everything together with my teams. Uh, so. It's, that's a hard question, but um, those are things that I did to find some ideas. What else? There's got to be one more. One more? 
Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Jonathan.